OK, so let me just finish. Uh, I've already getting close. Uh, how you can turn seawater into fuel. By now, you won't be surprised. It's a salt cycle. <laughs> OK, so how do you turn water into oxygen and hydrogen? Well, every high school student has been probably shown this experiment. You can do it with electrolysis. You hook up a battery to electrodes, uh, cap it with a test tube, and on one side you get oxygen, on the other side out comes hydrogen. So why don't we do this? The reason is because the electricity that you use in the battery is worth more <laughs> economically than the hydrogen and the oxygen does it. So nobody would do this. Not economically feasible. The other way you can do it is to add heat. No batteries, just add heat. Well, simple calculation. What does it take to dissociate water? 3,000 Celsius, OK? Well, most you now ask Professor Liu, can you give me an alloy? <laughs> He'll say, I can do it, but it's very expensive. <laughs> OK? So you won't do it either. But so nobody does it. But this is the holy grail. Now, it turns out that we're using a copper chloride cycle, there are three steps you can actually do it economically. The first is you don't dissociate water. You dissociate hydrochloric acid, or HCl, with copper chloride. Copper is a transition metal, so it can either have one chloride or it can have two chlorides. And so at using a little electricity, the copper chloride can help you extract that chlorine, leaving behind the hydrogen. So that's how you get the hydrogen. So how do you get the hydrogen chloride, the hydrochloric acid. Well, you take this copper chloride too, <coughs> and you react it with water. All right? You get them back <coughs> with this salt, uh, uh, the hydrogen chloride, plus copper oxygen chloride. So this helps uh, extract the oxygen away from water. Finally, this can be heated up to get a molten chloride which is what you had to start with, to give you oxygen. Right? <coughs> and the temperature you need here is only 530 degrees. Now, the amount of energy that you need to expend here is maybe only one-tenth compared to direct electrolysis. The 90% of it is supplied by heat. But heat is cheap, not like electricity, which is expensive, especially nuclear heat or burning Charcoal or coal is cheap, so this becomes economical, all right? At reasonable temperatures that Professor Liu can say, oh, I have a hope of giving you an alloy like that, but you might have to wait till next week, <laughs> OK? So the full cycle turns water plus heat plus electricity to give you hydrogen and oxygen. Now, Atomic Energy uh, of Canada Limited can do the first two steps. And we've been talking to them. Molten salt is something we think we can do easily. And they've also done an estimate, cost estimate, where if they use solar energy for the heat, they think they can produce one kilogram of uh, hydrogen for 17 Hong Kong dollars. Okay. Now, one kilogram of hydrogen is equivalent, roughly, to one gallon of gasoline equivalent. So I hope you're still partly on the imperial unit. So all of you know what one gallon or even one US gallon is. How much does that cost in Hong Kong dollars? Much more than 17 Hong Kong dollars, right? So certainly in Hong Kong, it would be worth it to do it. And if you can get even cheaper heat, it would be even worth it in the United States or Europe or yeah, almost anywhere in the world. So that's a way that you can do it. Now. <coughs> Let me belabor the point. One has to realize fossil fuels are deeply embedded in every aspect of industrialization. It's not only energy. It's how we make uh, uh, fertilizer. It's how we uh, make electricity, et cetera. Okay? For example, if you get oxygen, you can do carbon sequestration very easily. You burn something that has carbon in it, you get only carbon dioxide. Right? Why can't we do that and bury the carbon dioxide to sequester carbon? It's because if you burn it in air, there's a lot of nitrogen, much more than oxygen. And so you're spending all your time, money, 
bang nitrogen. Nobody would do that. Okay? So they want to do it, so then you have to separate the carbon dioxide from the nitrogen. That's not an easy process. Adds to the cost. That's why very few people are willing to do it. But if you burn it with oxygen, then it's easy. It's all carbon dioxide. You bear it, it becomes carbon negative. If your carbon source is carbon neutral, and now you bury its product, it becomes carbon negative. Hydrogen fuel cells, all right, I won't talk about it. When people talk about hydrogen fuel cells, that's a solution. Is it a solution? Where do you get the hydrogen? Right now, we get it from fossil fuels, from methane, from methanol, from whatever, okay? But if you get it from seawater, it really becomes fertilizer, all right? How do you capture nitrogen? Plants, very few plants can capture nitrogen and, <coughs> in a usable form. So the way that it's been done ever since Haber and... <coughs> and uh, Bosch won the Nobel Prize for discovering it, is to combine it with hydrogen to get ammonia. You combine ammonia with carbon dioxide, you get urea and water. Okay? And that's a carbon neutral fertilizer. Fertilizer, you may realize, no, is responsible for 75% of the so-called green revolution. If we didn't have fertilizer from the chemical industry, we would only be able to support one quarter of the world population that we have today. So we have, don't have a choice easily in the near term except to continue making fertilizer, but in a much more friendly way. All right? So this is, I'm not saying we should all do this. I'm sure somebody will do this if you give them the basic tools. So that's where uh, I'll 